Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Miguel, I would like to start by thanking you from the bottom of my heart for welcoming me here today. I could not have received a warmer welcome. In fact, I think there is only one person who could possibly receive a warmer welcome than that that I have received today, and that is a certain girl at a window. Um, I have been fortunate to get to know Miguel recently, and I feel honoured that we have been asked to participate in this exciting project of bringing a work into the spotlight within this marvellous museum. This fantastic museum collection is of such high quality. Um, it's of such high quality that to bring a work from Dulwich Picture Gallery here is an honour indeed. And so I am delighted this evening that you have come here to the museum to celebrate this moment when we are able to look at the girl at a window. And so I thought you might indulge me this evening in something that we have been talking about quite a long time, for quite a long time, at Dulwich Picture Gallery in London. And that is the fact that we have, with the girl at a window, London's Mona Lisa. And I thought this evening we could look at the question of whether Rembrandt's girl at a window really can live up to the reputation that I lay at her feet to say that she stands up alongside the world's most famous painting. And in order to go on this journey this evening, I thought I would start by introducing you to Dulwich Picture Gallery. I suspect some of you in this room will have visited the gallery. For those of you who haven't, it is in South East London. It is very easy to get to, 15 minutes from Victoria Station. So pretty close to the centre of London, but also very special because it is in a village. And the building is one of the masterpieces of one of Britain's most famous architects, Sir John Soane. And for us at Dulwich Picture Gallery, we are tremendously proud of our history because we can lay claim to being the world's oldest art gallery that was designed to be an art gallery. For when John Soane designed this building, he designed it with the sole purpose of housing a spectacular collection of art. So we are a building that was designed with the intention of being an art gallery, not a palace transformed into an art gallery, not a church housing paintings, but instead a gallery that was intended always to be a gallery. We welcomed our first visitors at Dulwich Picture Gallery in 1817. So last year we celebrated our bicentenary. That was when visitors first were able to come over the threshold and see the, one of the world's greatest collections of old master paintings, which was amassed by two collectors in order to form the Polish royal collection. Shortly after these two collectors had pulled together the collection, the Polish king um, was no longer the king of Poland. And so they had on their hands a collection of around 300 paintings. And so they offered it to a college in Dulwich in South London, because that college had the nucleus of an art collection. And they thought it would be the perfect location because it is London and also it is not London. It is close to the center, but it also feels rural. However, it was not their first choice. They had, in fact, offered the collection to the British government and suggested that Britain might like to have a national collection, a national gallery of art. And the government said no. But then, only a matter of around 12 years later, the National Gallery in London was formed. So it could be said that we Brits missed an opportunity, but any opportunity missed is also an opportunity gained.
So I wanted to start by showing you the facade of Dulwich Picture Gallery so that you can get a sense of this innovative architecture, and in particular, the way that Sir John Soane introduced top lights so that the picture gallery can be lit from above, allowing the paintings to be seen in what in the early 19th century was thought to be the ideal viewing conditions. And this is a setup that has been replicated in the picture gallery at Buckingham Palace and also at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, as well as many other places with which we would be familiar. There is something fundamentally British about Dulwich Picture Gallery. We have in our grounds the distinctive British telephone box. And this is no accident. We have this on proud display because the design of this part of the building of Dulwich Picture Gallery inspired the design of our famous telephone boxes. And so we display that for our visitors within our grounds to identify the fact that this building was hugely influential. But for me, it is what is inside that is most important. When visitors come to the gallery, they are sometimes surprised that at the heart of the experience, we have the coffins of our founders, a mausoleum where when visitors enter, they are surrounded by a strange yellow light. This is not a colour just on this image here, this is the colour of the space, which throughout the day changes depending on what the sun is doing, if in our British weather the sun comes out from behind a cloud. <laughs> And the fact that we have our founders at the centre of the building shows how we honour them. And here we have a watercolour of them. This makes me laugh, this image, because they seem so relaxed. On the left, we have Sir Francis Bourgeois. He seems almost asleep. And on the right, Noel Desenfon who is sitting with his leg up in the middle of telling a story, which I think indicates why Francis Bourgeois is nearly asleep, because it makes you think that his friend is constantly telling these stories and enjoying the sound of his own voice. The two of them were collectors. It was their business to go around, particularly the continent, amassing art. They knew the commercial art world so well and that is how they were given the commission to build up the Polish royal collection. Interestingly, Francis Bourgeois also enjoyed painting, and there are some instances within the collection which are slightly unfortunate, where he, with good intentions, improved some of the paintings, which happily we have been able to reverse in recent times. And here we have a watercolour showing some of the first visitors at the gallery. And I wanted to show this image and then to show an image of the gallery today. And then I stopped myself because there is something about the quality of this image that is so true to the experience of visiting Dulwich Picture Gallery today. The way that the light streams in from above. And the paintings that you see here, today we hang them in a much simpler arrangement, but they are the same paintings. There is a magical quality to Dulwich Picture Gallery because there is an integrity to a building that was designed for the paintings that it still houses. And I could talk for seven hours. I won't, Miguel, don't worry. But I could talk for seven hours about the quality of the paintings in the collection. But I thought you might like a context of those works. So I will just introduce you to a few of our um, top pieces. To start with, we have a very interesting pairing of a work by Jacob van Rysdale, the great Dutch landscape painter. And then on the right-hand screen, what looks to be exactly the same painting again. A copy by the great English landscape artist, John Constable. And I love this pairing because it reminds me as director of the gallery that the gallery first and foremost is an opportunity for people to learn. 
And throughout the 18th and 19th century, within Britain, there's a tradition of the Royal Academy and artists who reach the highest echelons of their career become royal academicians. And there is a tradition of the royal academicians using the collection at Dulwich Picture Gallery to study from, to learn from. <laughs> and so here we have a really good example of one of Britain's greatest artists learning from one of the great Dutch artists. And this is a fantastic opportunity to also show the interesting interventions that Francis Bourgeois made to the paintings. Because when we look at these paintings with, say, school groups at the gallery, I will often ask them, which painting is the earliest of the two? And they say, well, it looks to me as if the one on the right is earlier. And I say, oh, well, actually, no, that is the later, that is a copy. It comes, it comes later, it follows the earlier painting. And they say, yes, but actually it looks, it looks different. The colours look slightly different. And so then we play a game. In Britain we call the game Spot the Difference, to look at two pictures and to see where the differences are. And one of the main differences is here a man on a horse. Also slightly difficult to see, but there is a little dog somewhere around here. And the school groups would often say, children when looking at this, in fact any groups when looking at this would say, well, that would seem to be the earlier image and it has more detail in it. Well, the complexity comes from the fact that when John Constable copied this image, it had been augmented by Francis Bourgeois. And what any great commercial art dealer knows is that if you want to sell a painting, include a dog. <laughs> and Jacob van Rysdale had unfortunately not included a dog in his original painting. And so Francis Bourgeois in the, in the original Rysdale had inserted a horse and rider and a dog. When Constable saw the painting, he, of course, then replicated it exactly as he saw it. But when we conserved the Jacob van Rysdale around 20 years ago, we, of course, removed the overpainted elements. And so now the original painting somehow appears as if it could be later than the copy by John Constable. But the crux of this indicates how royal academicians were using the great Dutch paintings in Dulwich Picture Gallery to study. And there is a letter that John Constable wrote to a friend of his where he said some lines that really stay with me. He says, I saw this morning an affecting picture by Rysdale. It haunts my mind and clings to my heart. Now we don't know if it was exactly this painting he was talking about, but I think it was. And the way that he expresses himself about that painting, for me, unlocks what is so special about the Dulwich Picture Gallery collection. You can get close to these paintings and you can allow them to have an emotional impact on you. And that impression stays with you long after you leave the gallery. It can have a formative impact on your mood and on your well-being. And of course it doesn't just stop with Jacob van Rysdale and John Constable. We have, for instance, one of the foremost collections of paintings by Murillo in England. And these suited so well British taste, particularly in the early 19th century. And with these paintings, we are able to do so much work expressing the quality of Spanish painting and also looking at storytelling within paintings. What wonderful examples of paintings that really draw the viewer in. For me, particularly, the painting you see on the right-hand screen here, the way that this boy is lingering over eating his bread and he is chewing thoughtfully while considering whether to share it with his friend and perhaps with his other friend. <laughs> The quality doesn't stop there. We have great British paintings. Thomas Gainsborough, he's famous for a reason. This full-length portrait of two highly successful and 
spectacularly famous personalities of the 18th century, the Linley sisters, Elizabeth and Mary Linley. They performed on the stage, they were musicians, and in depicting them in this way, Gainsborough is able to show that he is at the top of his game because he has this commission to paint the celebrities of his age. We have works by Nicolas Poussin, more works by this French master than in any other gallery in England. We have works by Peter Paul Rubens, a selection of his oil sketches that are so raw and so beautiful. I see our visitors lingering in front of them for very long spells of time. And we have works by Van Dyck. This, one of the most celebrated early works by Van Dyck of Samson and Delilah. But it is often our Dutch masters that grab people's attention. Our Herit Dow of a woman playing the clavichord is a beautiful example of fine painting. Fine painting as a style of painting with exact attention to detail. I use this example on purpose because Herit Dow, at the time of painting this, was closely associated with Rembrandt. He became a pupil of Rembrandt in the late 1620s, and he learnt this technique of painting from the great master. But then Herit Dow continued in this style, whereas, as we know, Rembrandt branched out into a slightly different way of painting. So within the context of these works, how could I possibly say that we have a top painting at Dulwich Picture Gallery? When Dr. Zugaza came to see me at the gallery and spoke to me about this project here in Bilbao, how could he select which painting from Dulwich Picture Gallery would be the finest, would be the superlative? Well, I say that actually that selection is easy. Because for all of us who work at the gallery, we are so proud of the old masters that we have. We have around 650 paintings, so it is a small but perfectly formed collection. But wearing the crown of the collection is our girl at a window. We have three paintings by Rembrandt in Dulwich Picture Gallery, and yet this is the one this is our lead image. More than that, this is the best Rembrandt in the United Kingdom. More than that, this is one of the greatest paintings in the world. This is London's Mona Lisa. And the reason I say that is because this painting has something about it, a quality that encapsulates so much of what is great about the rest of our collection, and it has something else. And I thought we could explore that tonight. And you might disagree with me, but if you do, I'd like you to stay behind afterwards and we'll have some words. <laughs> this painting could be compared to the Mona Lisa for various reasons. If we think about Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, it is actually quite difficult to separate our understanding of the painting from its popular appeal. When you go to the Louvre, you know what it's like. It's so difficult to stop and enjoy the paintings and the build-up to seeing this work because there are arrows pointing towards it, people pushing past each other to get to it, cameras at the ready to prove we were there, we saw this painting. That builds up to such an extent that we can forget what made this painting so popular in the first place. But there is a word that people use so often when talking about the Mona Lisa. The word enigmatic. The fact that with this painting it is actually difficult to pin down what is so mysterious about it. But my goodness, people have tried. They talk particularly about the Mona Lisa's smile, about Lisa Gherardini's smile and the way that it plays on the corner of her mouth fleetingly, and the way that her head is tilted at an angle so that it seems that she might be about to turn, 
But even though she hasn't quite completely turned to face us, her eyes are engaging with us. And so that contrast of the head looking as if it's in motion, but the eyes fixed on ours as the viewer, I think that's a key to what makes this so special. The hands, oh, those hands, are so beautiful and remind me, of course, of Leonardo's wonderful studies of hands. The way that they rest so gently one upon the other. The landscape setting, so interesting. Where is this? Is it fantastical or is it real? The muted colours, so that when you look at the painting, it washes over you, because even though the blue can be somewhat startling, it does not jar. It all seems to work. All of these elements come together so well, I could be at risk of convincing myself that in fact this is, hands down, the greatest painting in the world. But let's look at some of the echoes and some of the antecedents of what Leonardo was doing. For instance this. As Miguel said, I was curator of paintings for 10 years at Royal Collection Trust, and within that magnificent collection, there is this work by Hans Memling. And I used to spend a lot of time looking at this painting and wondering what on earth it was about, who the sitter was. We had no idea of his identity. But in particular, the tilt of the head, so strange. Seven-eighths angle, a seven-eighths angle, rather than the three-quarter angle that we might be used to, or a profile view. <laughs> And the mouth. So odd how the mouth turns down resolutely at the corners. If Memling had just put one slightly different angle on that mouth, this would seem so much softer as a painting. And the hair that looks so light, when you look at it for long enough, you realize how rigorous it is. So perfectly cut and turned under. It puts me to shame. <laughs> this painting has a similar sort of quality to the Mona Lisa. But this isn't London's Mona Lisa. In Dulwich Picture Gallery, we have this work, which, when it was acquired by our collectors, Desenfant and Bourgeois, was thought to be by Leonardo da Vinci. So surely this should be uh, London's Mona Lisa. And here again, we have a man we do not know the identity of. We don't know who this sitter is. And in a similar way to the Hans Memling, the position of the head is slightly strange. Not a full profile and the shadow down one side. So very interesting, the shadow from the hair. But he doesn't meet our gaze, and so this painting leaves us cold. And we now know it is not by Leonardo da Vinci, but instead by Piero di Cosimo. These paintings play with a similar sort of theme as the Mona Lisa. When thinking of studies, of portrait studies, an artist who has sat with a person for multiple sittings, thinking about their features and their personality and the effect of the painting, these portraits tell us so much about the ambitions of an artist. And when we put them alongside the Mona Lisa, I think they help to see a context within which artists are working when thinking about ways of making a person appear real. And the element that stands out most for me within that is a sense of mystery. Because if an artist creates some mystery, some sense of who is this person or are they about to turn and engage with me? Do they care about having their portrait painted? then that is what hooks the viewer and creates a really interesting moment. But when we look at Rembrandt, he of course was aware of all of these elements that make a great painting. And he, for example, in this painting from the National Gallery in Edinburgh, he incorporates a sense of mystery, a figure leaning out of a bed, 
a figure parting the curtain and where we see her face in quite a complex angle, so difficult to paint. An angle where we realise that, in fact, this isn't a cold portrait, but instead is a story. A figure who is engaging with probably the artist, so that we think this woman in bed is probably interacting with the artist, is probably his partner. And in a similar way to the Mona Lisa and the Piero di Cosimo portrait and the Memlink portrait, we get a sense of movement. But when Rembrandt creates movement, he does it first and foremost using light. And we hear this so often, Rembrandt is so good at um, mastering light. But here, with this painting, we can see it really overtly on this flash of white here on the woman's tunic. And then as we see that light there, we then think, oh, the light hits her forehead and then down on her nose and helps to tell the story of the drama of this moment. This painting helps me to understand why Our Girl at a Window is such a good work, because I understand how Rembrandt was thinking about light. But I think the Dulwich painting is better. There is also this great Rembrandt in the United Kingdom, a painting that I have loved since I was a child, showing um, Rembrandt's lover, probably, Hendrike Stoffels, crossing a stream. A deeply intimate painting. And yet again, we see him using light, using white paint to evoke light in order to tell a story. And the mystery of the thing, the way that we think, well, does she know that we are watching her? And then we realize, Sh no, she doesn't. This is private. This is a private painting. And Rembrandt tells us that mostly because the light seems somehow ethereal and otherworldly, and we feel we are not welcome in this scene. It's so clever. And he knows, he plays with the antecedents, with the tricks of painting figureheads. He is aware of the work of Leonardo da Vinci. He is aware of the innovations of Hans Memling. He knows how to paint a face in action. This is a great painting. And when thinking about how Rembrandt did this, how he manipulated light, there is a very interesting drawing, which I wonder if you've seen it before, which is held in the collection of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, which shows a figure sitting within an artist's studio. And in fact, this is Rembrandt's studio. Rembrandt's studio in his house on the Breerstraat in Amsterdam. And for me, I've enjoyed this drawing for many years and thought it very interesting, but then one day I had a moment of realisation that this drawing shows us Rembrandt's method. Because this is his studio where he is teaching his assistants. There is a model sitting ready to be captured, and Rembrandt in fact captures the model, probably in order to instruct his assistants how to do it. And she is bathed in light that streams in from the window. And if you've been to the Rembrandt house in Amsterdam, you'll know how amazing Rembrandt's studio is. And how when you see these grand windows, you understand the master. I can relate to Rembrandt walking into that house and thinking, I must live and work here. Because the light is so wonderful. But his method is to manipulate light with linens on the window. He would pull the linen up, he would pull the linen down. He would get darkened pieces of material and fabric and attach them to the window so that he could manipulate, he could play God and make sure that the light came in at particular angles that suited him and what he wanted to do. When we see this drawing, we realise that nothing in Rembrandt's paintings is accidental. And that helps me to understand another great painting from the Louvre, the separate Emmaus. 
And the way that here he is manipulating light in his own head and thinking, how can you make light tell a religious story? And here we have the moment of revelation at the supper at Emmaus when Christ reveals himself to the disciples when they realize that the man that they have been sitting and having dinner with is the man that they had been following and who they thought was dead. And then he reveals himself through light. And Rembrandt tells it so well with the simple tablecloth. This is great storytelling. The Louvre could say this is also their Mona Lisa. And interestingly, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. has a very similar Rembrandt, which I wonder if you've, which you're familiar with. This is a less famous painting, but it should be more well known. It shows a mythological moment which echoes the supper at Emmaus. And in this scene, we see Mercury and Jupiter being revealed to their hosts at a dinner where their hosts thought that they were ordinary mortals and then suddenly realize that they are in the presence of gods. And Rembrandt tells this moment of revelation not with a simple flash of white on a tablecloth, but instead with two sources of light. Here, a magical light behind the two gods, and here, in the hearth, in the fireplace, so that the scene is balanced, so that we get a sense of the revelation coming out of the shadows. And there is a painting in the Royal Collection by Rembrandt, which equally shows Rembrandt's majestic handling of light, where again we have a moment of revelation, Christ revealing himself to Mary Magdalene after he has risen from the dead. Mary Magdalene, Magdalene has been left behind at the tomb, the gardener comes to talk to her, and then she starts to realise that he is Christ. So often in this telling, we have the moment where Mary Magdalene is talking to Christ, and he says, touch me not. Rembrandt doesn't tell that moment. He tells a moment of dawning recognition not the dramatic moment of Christ saying, no, don't touch me, but instead the moment of intellectual, psychological change within Mary Magdalene as she realises who this man is. And that is so poetically told in the turn of her head, which is bathed in light. It is simplicity itself. It is great storytelling. It was so influential. Rembrandt's last pupil, Arendt de Gelder, is represented in the Dulwich Picture Gallery collection in this wonderful painting of Jacob's dream, where Jacob is lying fast asleep and he has his dream of angels going up and down a ladder. But where is the ladder in this painting? Who needs a ladder? when you can use light. Arendt de Gelder was following Rembrandt's practice. He was following his master in telling this painting simply through color and the explosion of yellow and then the angel in resplendent glory and then so daringly the darkness. But we see a light coming down here which indicates to us the line of the ladder that we know exists in the story. This is following Rembrandt's innovation. And this is another example of how great Dulwich Picture Gallery's collection is. And of course, as a director of the gallery, I want to advocate for its strengths. But as you've just seen, it is very hard to pick superlatives it is very difficult to say one painting is better than another. We could be comparing apples and pears if we want to compare Leonardo da Vinci and Rembrandt van Rijn. But let us pause on the girl at a window for a moment while I make my case. The Mona Lisa creates an air of mystery because we don't know what the sitter is thinking. 
The Mona Lisa's face looks as if it is in motion, while of course being still because it is captured in paint. The Mona Lisa has muted tones that don't startle us, even though there are different colours within that painting. The Mona Lisa has an emotional impact on viewers, so that they remember the feeling that they had when they saw that painting, even if they can't remember every detail of it. And the Mona Lisa is painted with such supreme skill that people use it as a shorthand for what great art is. Rembrandt's Girl at a Window creates a sense of mystery. Rembrandt's Girl at a Window engages us with her eyes, even though we get the sense that she has recently been moving and active, and that at any moment she might move, but for the time being, she is completely still. This painting has a legend attached to it. It belonged to the French art theorist, Roger de Peel, and he wrote about it in the early 18th century. And he said that this painting, when Rembrandt had just finished it, was set in his window in the Breerstraat in Amsterdam. So this was painted in 1645 when Rembrandt was at the height of his powers. He was 39 years old and he lived in that house. We saw the interior of his studio in that drawing from the Ashmolean Museum. And Roger de Peel wrote of this painting that this was set in the window of the house and people walking past stopped in awe because they first thought, why is that servant girl pausing in her duties? How can she stand still for so long? And then they realise it's a painting. This story is so clever because it takes us back to the ancient stories of the greatest artist, Apelles. And the test of a great artist was that he could create an image of life that was so lifelike that you would think it was the human form itself. You would question whether it was the artist who made the work or whether it was God, because the work itself was human. It's a complex thought process, but it's the mark of the perfect artist if he can mimic reality with such finesse. It was in Roger de Peel's best interests to create this legend. We don't know if such a thing is true. But we do know that this painting creates the sense that the sitter has just stopped. And we think that she probably is a servant girl. But she's not wearing servant clothes. She's wearing very strange clothes. On her head, it's very difficult to see, but when you go back and look at the painting in detail, you'll see she has a cap on her head. Quite uh, an intricately decorate, decorative um, cap. And then the cap has two tassels that come down the side of her shoulder. And then she wears what seems to be a sort of oversized linen top which has two strands of gold which possibly are joining together the opening on the front of the shirt. Her sleeves are slightly rolled up, so some people say this indicates she's been working, she's pulled up her sleeves to work. But other people say, well, this indicates that these clothes are not her own, that Rembrandt has dressed her up. He was famous for having a box full of outfits that he would dress even his mother up in in order to paint her looking exotic and not just looking like his own mother. We call it The Girl at a Window because of the story. Roger de Peel's story about this painting being set in the window of Rembrandt's house means that we call this painting The Girl at a Window. We don't know if the girl herself is actually le leaning on a window ledge or not. It's possible that this is just a stone plinth. It's possible that this painting shows a scene outdoors. It's possible that this painting shows a scene indoors. It's possible that this painting shows outdoors, indoors. Perhaps it is a window ledge after all. It's so clever because Rembrandt doesn't really want us to know. 
The background is confusing. People have argued, is there a landscape in the background or is it a stone wall? And when you look really closely at the painting, focus your eye on this part of the painting because people will often say to you, well, Rembrandt, it's all brown. Brown, 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 and then some white. And this is to grossly underestimate this artist. He is layering up his dark tones with so many colours, and in this section he uses blue. There is a blue pigment, and once you see it, then the painting lightens up and you realise how complex his use of colour is. He doesn't want us to know the specifics of this painting, because I think Rembrandt learned that if you give too much detail, if you, for instance, have a woman crossing a stream, then you take away the intensity of being able to focus solely on a person, on their eyes, on their face. This is London's Mona Lisa for me, because Rembrandt knowingly is building on what has been great in the art of the past, and playing to his own strengths of storytelling. He takes realistic details. When you look at the girl's hands, you'll see she has a tan line, a suntan line. So her hands are used to being outdoors, whereas the top of her arm is normally covered. So we know she must be somebody who works and who is used to having her hands get quite rough. She spends time outdoors, we also know, because there are little marks, blemishes on her hands, which are quite difficult to see, and on her arm here. But once you see them, you can't unsee them. They are little red spots. We think they are mosquito bites. She has insect bites on her arms. Rembrandt painted this girl and he included the insect bites on her arms. He is playing with us. Because at once she seems so perfect and so imperfect. On the ledge in front of her, I think there is a little splash of water. Miguel and I discussed it earlier and it could instead be an imperfection in the stone itself. But that little flash of white there is a clever motif because then our eye jumps from that into the dazzling white of her clothing and then from there up to her face. And that is where we want to linger with this painting, to be drawn in to the gaze of this girl. So still. The little flash of red on her cheeks, so that she seems as if she's perhaps been pinching her cheeks. So that, again, we are relating ourselves to the, to the real moment of a young sitter thinking, I must make myself perhaps have red cheeks for the great Rembrandt to paint me. But then we've been fooled again because who knows, it's Rembrandt who's painting this, not the little girl. And so he is the one who decides to give us the little flashes of red on the cheeks and the shadow down the side of her face. And then that beautiful orange of her lips. There is something so captivating about this painting and it captures all of the qualities that I think people associate with the great Mona Lisa. The qualities that make us think we are in the presence of greatness when we see this painting. And yet for me, it really comes down to only one thing. In fact, forget everything I've said about this painting. Forget everything I've said about Rembrandt, everything I've said about Leonardo da Vinci and all the other artists in this talk. And think perhaps only about one thing. The act of an artist making a painting. And the moment when he thinks, have I finished this? Is this painting done? And then think of the sickening feeling when he reaches for his brush one more time and he thinks there's one last thing to do and he adds a tiny little flash of white on the girl's nose and then the painting is finished. It's one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in a painting. 
Because once you've seen it, you realize that Rembrandt was dancing on the edge of greatness. And he was able to put one little flick of paint on a nose and transform what could have been one of his best works into ultimately one of his greatest works. A painting that with a little highlight on the nose makes us think that this little girl is so real, but she, like a painting, like the painting by Jakob van Rysdale for John Constable, she can cling to our hearts and stir our soul. There is meaning in this painting. It makes us feel at once so alive and so connected to the 17th century. <laughs> 350 years can fall away into nothing when we realize that we as humans can relate to a dramatic moment like this and the way that an artist so spectacularly can put a bit of white on a nose and make a flat painting come alive. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with this painting I present to you London's Mona Lisa because this painting should be a shorthand for greatness. And I commend Miguel Zugaza for asking us for this loan. We don't lend this painting. This is our top work. And yet, when Miguel talked to me about the concept of this exhibition, and putting this one painting in an exhibition that consisted of one painting, I thought that is as bold as Rembrandt himself. And it allows us the space to take it seriously and also to take some time out of our busy lives and to enjoy the mastery of a great artist at work and to be able to take away a little sense of celebrity, that touch of magic and the understanding that we don't always know everything but sometimes we can be wowed by the sheer possibility of human talent. Thank you very much for welcoming me here, for celebrating Dulwich Picture Gallery's greatest painting, and for indulging me this evening with my fantasy that this is our Mona Lisa. But I will continue with this, because in fact this is a painting that must be taken very seriously indeed, and I hope you enjoy it while it remains here in Bilbao in this very special display. Muchas gracias.